Aloha and welcome everyone for joining us. A very, very eventful week. A lot, a lot of possible things to pick out of the air. And we're going to focus in on what the recently leaked first draft Roe v. Wade overturned opinion from the US Supreme Court tells us and what concerns it raises. And we're extremely fortunate to have with us today on her birthday, Tina Patterson from Germantown, Maryland, mediator, arbitrator, experienced entrepreneur and business coach, Rebecca Ratliff, one of the leading insurance claim executives in the country for many years and now a leading mediator and arbitrator nationally and internationally. And Louise Ng, very timely and appropriate the APABA, Asian Pacific American Bar Association Group awardee this year, together with a women's rights advocate and leading attorney in Hawaii for a good number of years. Well, <clears throat> we've all seen what uh, Justice Alito has to say. What strikes you, having seen what he said? What's missing? What's wrong with that, in your view? Where does he go off the rail? Tina, you want to start us off? Actually, I'm going to defer to Louise on this one for a legal opinion first. OK, Louise. Oh, thanks, Tina. But I, I think I'm, I've lateral things to Tina before. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. I don't know where to, to begin. Um, I, I, I think what strikes me is the fact that um, I, I, there, you know, there is a sense of betrayal on, on so many levels from the time of uh, confirmation hearings where many of these uh, people who have signed on to the, um, the opinion have claimed that Roe v. Wade was settled law and um, basically not to be disturbed. And, and then to have this uh, just, you know, not even to make an effort to pretend that they're just sort of moving a little bit to just have this totally, you know, polarity of views on what's happened. And, and uh, you know, also to just misrepresent the history, to, to claim that that this is only reflecting what the history has been um, on abortion, when in fact there's more information coming out on how the whole, all of the laws um, against abortion are of fairly recent origin. That you know this was not something that existed in the 17 or 1800s. Um, I, I also think it's just incredibly dangerous to be re-examining the scope of the right of privacy and then to claim that it has nothing to do with all these other civil rights that have sprung from the right of privacy, like same-sex marriage and um, the right to contraception and the like, to say somehow that's different. Um, I just see this as a, a very dangerous, slippery slope. And one that just seems to be, I don't know, just it's sort of um, totally disregarding the advances in the idea that, you know, women that of the right to privacy that women should have a decision over their own bodies and and principles that have been you know I've seen developed from the time I was a college student until now and not and you know hard to imagine and sad to imagine that now we face the idea that it's going to be left to the political winds of every wind winds of every state Rebecca what strikes you about this? I think Louise uh, hit the nail on the head. Um, dangerous is, is the word that comes to mind for me because um, this can set so many wheels in motion in so many areas um, that it's it's a little, it's, well, it's not a little scary, it's a lot scary for the reasons that she gave. Um, it can open up Pandora's box. And our country is fragmented um, as it is. And to, to now leave, you know, to have this 
this law changed and to have the states um, be able to uh, weigh in with, with their flavor um, could, could really just, uh, could just tear up the country uh, worse than, than it is. Um, there are so many different um, reasons why a woman might need to make a decision about her body. And it's, um, it's, I just, I do feel that it's very dangerous and it's a very sad time for America that this is being contemplated. My concern too, is that it's just done. There's no, there's no vision or view to it. I mean, what are we trying to do here? Is it legislating morality rather than keeping this a medical decision between a woman and her doctor? Are we trying to make people more moral, take care of kids? Because I, you know, if that's the case, then we can't just, you know, ban abortions. There needs to be a whole social network or system put into place to, you know, support parents and children and children from unwanted pregnancies and the like. Um, you know, is that going to be happening in these um, states banning abortion? I don't know. I, I'm not optimistic. Tina, I think your thoughts? Sure. Um, I think the timing is unsettling. The, the one, the leak, um, the, the, the timing of the leak, the fact that there was a leak, and the timing of the Supreme Court bringing this forward to the public. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's a, that all of this is unfolding as we are entering midterm elections and that it's um, not just politicized, but literally parties are taking different positions. And the fact of the matter is the topic or subject of abortion is not always defined by political party. It's literally defined by that person's beliefs, perspectives, and experience. I, I always tell people, if you want to find a room, divide a room, have them talk about birth, death, and property. Those three topics will divide people immediately because each person has a different perspective. And underlying each of those three areas is the, this concept of power. What Having power over who comes into this world or the choice that you can make as, as to who comes into this world how you leave this world and, and what context do you leave? Do you leave cremated? Do you leave in a, a casket? Do you own property or do you have to go through someone else? So the timing to me um, is very interesting. I also think that it's, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise and because we've seen the swing. Uh, and I, I still am of the perspective that we are undergoing huge changes from a societal perspective, um, uh, uh, talking about race, racism, gender, who we love, how we love. And now, as was called out by Louise, this right to privacy, how, how you maintain your body or what you do with your body, your choice. Um, I do think that it's, it's part of this pushback. We see it with critical race theory. And this to me is just another step in that pendulum swinging back and people really conflating fiction versus what the reality is of Roe versus Wade and what this means or what it could potentially mean. So it, it's very unsettling. And those are really important insights because putting this back in a historical perspective as for example, Boston history professor Heather Cox Richardson does so very well in her Six day a week blog letters from an American, which I commend to everyone. Very, very well researched and thought out and presented. Is you now have for the first time in decades a, despite a popular majority, favoring a woman's reproductive rights. A, a small, white male Christian minority operating in favor through state legislatures of restrictive women's reproductive rights, restrictive voting rights, restrictive educational and employment rights and protections. 
all of these things under the guise of state right, states' rights, which was exactly the pretext that was used in the Civil War to try and perpetuate slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we come full, full circle? Just like that, doesn't it? In many well, ways, yes. Scary to me because, you know, I didn't want to sound too extreme, but uh, yeah, my thought was, well, you know, there might be um, some uh, legislators in states <laughs> that want black people out picking cotton again. I mean, it's this is uh, that I know that sounds really extreme, but since you brought it up, Chuck, uh, you know, when I was saying that it, it's scary for so many reasons, that was one of the things. Civil rights um, are in jeopardy on many levels. And that seems to be exactly the point that this is only one of many really critical personal, private, individual civil rights protections that now stands at risk of being eroded on a claim of interpretation of our history and traditions by justices who clearly have not been educated in and don't know what our rich cultural history and traditions of all of our peoples, especially people of color and indigenous peoples really may be. Those, the groups that you're, so indigenous peoples, African-Americans raised here, Africans who live in America, um, but maybe were educated in some in America and, and some abroad, um, Caribbean Americans, Latino Americans, um, Asian Americans. We all, although we are black and brown people, we all have, though we have some shared experiences, we all have very, very different historical experiences. And sometimes um, as a mediator um, uh, and as a, uh, as a speaker, a, a lot of times when I'm a panelist, I'm talking about cultural competency and the, you know, the importance of understanding that every brown person is not the same. Every brown person doesn't think the same. And, you know, again, though we have some shared experiences, there are many things that we see differently because in context of our culture, there are different realities that apply to maybe one group and not another. And, you know, that's, that's a reality um, here. And, you know, uh, Tina mentioned critical race theory and how it's being canceled uh, in so many different states. Um, this is just, uh, it's just a scary time in our history where um, I'll go back to what Luis said. What are we really trying to accomplish? What, what is all of this really about? Um, and the minority of people who are kicking up all of this dust, um, it, you know, you just have to wonder what the end game is and, you know, and, and why. Um, harmony. You know, I, I pick harmony, although we don't all have to agree all the time, we're not going to always agree. Sometimes I don't agree with myself. Um, but harmony really is a beautiful thing when we take care of each other. We were, I believe we were created to be communal. And the division of Americans and people really um, all over the world, especially at a time of pandemic when there, there are already so many uh, factors of instability, it's just a, it's just a, it's a bad, you know, it's a bad time. And, and Tina spoke to the timing of it. Time and timing, um, you know, we'll tell the story later because, um, yeah, what is the reason for this to happen now? Um, and, you know, who really is behind it? You have to think that these um, issues are very highly motivated, which is even more scary. <clears throat> Louise, your thoughts? Oh, yeah, um, you know, it, you're right. It just seems like one in, incidence of just a whole disease of, um, you know, so the anti-democratic, anti-multicultural movement in this country. And 
um, you know, my, my question then is, okay, how do we combat that in the long run? Um, you know, I think we go back again to the importance of voting. Um, we go back to the importance of making sure that the voice of the, you know, those, those values are reflected in our local and state legislators, legislatures. Um, there was a commentary I heard on, on NPR this morning about how, you know, the Republicans have really focused over the last decades on building up their political power in the state and the Democrats not so much. And I'm thinking, well, why not? I mean, that was, you know, we got a clue during the Trump years that we needed to focus on our local and state governments to shore that up. Um, but I just think that this underscores the need for, uh, you know, being vigilant about voting rights, getting people out to vote, and also just, you know, continuing to tell a positive story about the values of multiculturalism and the good things that are happening. There's so many bad things happening in the world right now that you, you know, just want to pull the covers over your head. But it seems to me this is the time that we just need to, uh, you, you know, make sure that we're educating the next generation to be, you know, much more open minded and humane and communal and, you know, multicultural than what is, I hope, um, you know, a slowly shrinking minority view that right now is just too dominant in our culture. And that's an important insight and perspective because we know that a lot of the history and traditions of this country moved strongly in a direction of inequality, mistreatment, disrespect for people who were not male, white, Christian landowners, the way things started out. And that over the last particularly 50 years or so, a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice have gone into moving the needle in a more balanced, less unequal, less disrespectful direction. <laughs> and now to have that needle swing back so far, so quickly through minority control. What do you see that might help us get back on track? We have to keep speaking out. We have to keep talking. Um, Many of the programs I've done, if I'm moderating, I end um, my parting words are stay safe, but don't stay silent. Um, we have to keep having these conversations and facilitating conversations, being willing to be uncomfortable. Um, these are uncomfortable uncom topics because um, people don't really want to admit to the stain of racism and, and um, you know, slavery, racism, the sins of America. People don't really want to talk about it. And, you know, we've talked to about allyship and what that really means. Um, and what I know is ally is a verb, even though it's a noun in the dictionary, ally is a verb. Um, there are many people who are aspiring allies, and I've had people say, I'm an ally. Um, and I thought, well, you, you're trying. Um, but an ally is willing to be uncomfortable willing to speak out against um, injustice and inequality and inequity. Um, Chuck Crumpton is an ally, um, you know, a person who is, is willing to be criticized for supporting what is right, not what is comfortable. And the conversations that Chuck facilitates and that Louise um, facilitates, um, and we don't have, have um, our our comrade Sandra on uh, on this one, but you know Tina and I um, are um, you know happy to to have and lead conversations around these topics so that people can be seen, heard, so that perspectives can be shared, so that solutions can be found. And that's you know this this really is a movement. There is a movement of of there is an evil movement. And there is a just movement and people have to pick a side because again, uh, silence is complicit. If you're, if you're silent, we hear you. Um, and you know, people at this point need to, to pick a side. I pray it's democracy. Um, but it's, you know, we have to continue to have these conversations 
to keep not just the awareness um, going, but also the activity around making things better together. Oh, exactly you know, I, right. Yeah, go that ahead. reminds me, I was just thinking that, um, you know, sometimes when, you know, you've suffered a personal setback or insult, you have to think this is not going to define me. And to me, this setback is not one that ought to define the, the work of those of us who want to have a different, more just democratic, um, you know, multicultural society. And this is our, you know, sort of the, the bell sort of the bell to get us to move forward. I mean, I, I do think of this past years and maybe the coming years as one of focusing on allyship and intersectionality um, and building coalitions across different groups. Um, you know, in the course of planning an a Asian Pacific Heritage Month event for our firm, one of our speakers um, who's Asian American talked about his work on a black reparations panel in California because they have a legislative initiative going forward to study black reparations. And his, his approach is, you know, the, why the Asian American community is, should be supporting this and, uh, you know, the, his, the common historical roots. And so I think that, you know, this, we need this reminder of the bad things that could happen to try to get you know ignore that and just move forward <laughs> get the right people to get together and you're exactly right I love that Rebecca stay safe and don't say stay silent people need to be willing to speak up I agree with Rebecca regarding the idea of speaking up but I, I, I also think this leak and the conversation regarding Roe versus Wade is an opportunity to have a larger discussion regarding reproductive rights and women and, and where we are in terms of how we discuss reproduction, um, how we discuss our bodies, how we discuss the choices that we make. It, it, again, timing. In the US, we're coming up on Mother's Day. And the, the part of this discussion regarding Roe versus Wade is abortion and, and how is abortion perceived? And we're seeing, well, I'm seeing on social media, women talking about, and not the stereotypical person, actresses um, and other people who are well-recognized saying why they had to make a decision. I think it's also important we're hearing as we talk about the reasons in which abortion may be permissible are things that we wouldn't, that are considered taboo, incest, human trafficking, and at times other health reasons, rape um, would be another, um, reason. Ha having a discussion about that and taking the taboo away from these topics, but also taking the taboo away from women's reproductive um, stages as we become young women, as we move into our re full reproductive years, and as we age. There, there's still this discussion that we don't have about women aging and a woman deciding that she wants to be a mother or she doesn't want to be a mother. And that the taboo that's associated with that is underlying part of this, um, this discussion and, and where we're seeing the division. I think it's an excellent opportunity to have that, that talk and to really come together. Again, across cultures, um, you know, what does it mean? And in some cultures, it, it's lauded. You, you know, having a child or having, being a mother is, is highly regarded. And for other communities, yes, if you do it, great. But you know, taking that stigma away and saying, here, here's what can happen. Here are the choices. Here are the many paths. But at the end of the day, it's my choice. It's my body. And that's a really important centering value to come back to, is that as we've seen in the polls favoring abortion, favoring protection of voting rights, favoring same-sex marriage, favoring open sexual preference classifications. All of those things have indicated, if anything, the efforts to build a growing respect and appreciation and understanding for the most personal private choices uh, of each other has been growing, at least in the populace at large. And, but now we have a situation where neither the federal legislative branch nor 
apparently the federal judicial branch is going to protect those civil, personal, private rights. Hey, and the states are questionable. So where do we go from here? We do have a few state legislatures, hopefully more, that are you know vowing to um, uphold the right of privacy and the right to reproductive choice. We were just having discussion today, today about how some employers are taking it upon themselves to offer benefits to women who need to travel um, for uh, you know to terminate their pregnancy and the like. So I you know I just think yeah you're right, Tina and Rebecca, great I you know points about. We need to get the stories out. This needs to be the start of a conversation. And we need to think about all the different ways that we can, whether in private or public forums, support um, reproductive rights. And that's a great reminder because maybe the decisions and the choices should best look for their protection at the levels where people are interacting directly rather than protection by government forces, which clearly can be politically directed or manipulated. Okay, in our last minute, any last thoughts on where we are, where we're headed? Rebecca? I, I guess I'll just say that I know a lot of the points that I made or make um, often when we're having these discussions are broad, um, which is why I appreciated Louise identifying that so much of what we talk about and the issues when we're drilling down are intersectional. One thing affects something else. And, you know, and every, everything that we do, um, all the spaces we're in, the, the politics around, uh, you know, these issues, well, that, that don't start off uh, politicized, but get politicized, it all ends up affecting us as individuals and how we live and interact, how we live personally and professionally. And so I just, I, I wanna say Chuck, thank you for this platform for us to have these conversations. And thank you all. Uh, Louise, last thoughts? Um, sure, I, I did have one, but I think it, it, it left me. But anyway, I just think this is part one of a continuing discussion because this is going, we, we need to sort of keep this for, you know, front and center on how this is going to uh, motivate our activism. Um, one little thing I did, as I think I pointed out to you, I started wearing my Ruth Bader Ginsburg pin um, to remind me about um, courageous women who have you know, set a good example for all of us. And we need to remember people like that. Chuck, I think you were trying to find a quote by her. Um, who remembers that well, about Tina, reproductive? Tina found it. And Tina, it's your birthday. We honor you today, especially. <laughs> All right. Any last um, words? Yes, I am going to read a quote from um, former Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It is a decision she must make for herself. When government controls that decision for her, she is being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. And what a great place to wind us up for today, to remind us all the most important thing we can do is to respect, understand, and honor that individual worth and value in each of us. Thank you all. Thanks Thank you. to those who join us. Come back in two weeks and many more topics, including probably more on this one. Take care. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.